As a 400 hurdler, I sit firmly in the sprint events section of track and field. And while speed and power and hurdle clearance are key parts of success in my event, fitness is also a super critical part of it. Because of this, in the off season, the first part of it is spent doing longer, slower sessions aimed at building this fitness and the foundation from which we can then build speed and power from. So why am I telling you this in a video about shoes designed for the purpose of allowing a man to run a sub two hour marathon? This is because if you're a runner, you've either heard of or have followed the development of these shoes and are even aware of the results surrounding the shoes themselves. As a sprinter, I was curious about these shoes and the technology and development of them as I knew it would change the way shoes were thought of and the development of shoes moving forward, much like the development of spikes did for track and field itself. But also because I'm willing to try anything that might make those gruelling longer sessions easier or at least more enjoyable. In November 2016, Nike announced that they had organised a team of three elite marathon runners to train and ultimately race a private race aimed at breaking the two-hour mark for the marathon. Elliot Kipchoge eventually won the race in a time of two hours flat and 25 seconds. The race time was below the then world record of two hours, two minutes and 57 seconds. But unfortunately it was not eligible to be considered a world record as he and the other two elites ran with a number of interchangeable pacemakers and thus had external help in maintaining the necessary pace. Nike however did develop a new running shoe specifically for the event called the Vaporfly Elite. These shoes were a great shoe, or so I've heard. They were never commercially released. What made them so special was the midsole material called Zoom X. According to Nike, it was remarkably lighter, softer and more responsive than traditional foams. But what made these shoes so unique was that they had a carbon fibre plate, which was designed to cushion the runner whilst maintaining responsiveness and speed during a long race where the athlete tires. Nike did release two shoes that had components of this elite shoe in them, the Vaporfly 4% and the more commercially available Zoom Fly. Both quickly became a favourite shoe of mine. They were light, supportive and gave a great little push off the ground that I used to appreciate when I was warming up for competitions or getting ready for a training session on tired, dead legs. The main difference between these two shoes was that the Zoom Fly was an everyday shoe and the 4% was designed specifically for racing. And these are mine. You'll notice the 4% are missing. I'd like to say that I hope the person who borrowed my pair from my training bag is getting blisters from them. But moving right along. The next version of these shoes were the Nike Zoom X Vaporfly Next Percent. This shoe built on the 4% by introducing the vapor weave material into the shoe which is a material that is incredibly strong but lightweight, water resistant, meaning that they do not soak up water at all. This then means there's no extra weight when you're racing in the rain. Naturally, the shoe still contains the now controversial carbon plate, meaning that the wearer, in theory, has a racing shoe that is lightweight, cushioning and helps support them in the later stages of the races. Fantastic, huh? The Vaporfly Next Percent were a commercial success from day one. People not only wanted to wear the shoes that were developed to break a two-hour marathon mark and came so close to it, but they also found them to be comfortable and lightweight, basically everything Nike promised them to be. At $320 Australian, they aren't cheap either, but as elite runners worldwide started wearing them in races and began running some incredible times, many began to believe that the shoe offered an unfair advantage. Independent and Nike-sponsored studies confirmed that the shoes increased athletes' energetic efficiency by 4% or more, which can yield a significant advantage in a marathon-length event. How do they do this? Well, the combination of the shoe's foam and carbon fibre sole ensures that less energy is lost in each footfall or step. The governing body for athletics, World Athletics, formed a working group to look into this technology and decide if it was mechanical doping. While the governing body of the sport was looking into this matter, most other top shoe companies started developing their own version of carbon plated shoes in what can only be described as a case of if you can't beat them, join them. After all, there is every chance that the governing body will allow these shoes to continue to be used in competitions. 
Ciccone developed the Endorphin Pro, Hoka 1-1 the Carbon X, and Adidas the Adi Zero Adios Pro, just to name a few. But Nike weren't done yet. On the 12th of October 2019, Kipchoge made a second attempt at the sub two hour marathon mark, and he did it, running one hour, 59 minutes and 40 seconds. Again, because it wasn't an official race and had a set of rotating pacemakers to keep him on the required pace, the result isn't an official world record. But he still did it. This time, he worked closely with Nike in the development of a shoe that they felt improved upon both the 4% and the next percent, the Alpha Fly. This shoe has the foam, the carbon plate, but has an additional two responsive AirPods positioned at the forefront of the shoe, designed to propel the wearer forward. And as you can imagine, if you thought critics were complaining about the next percent, while well, they became even louder after Nike confirmed that the Alpha Fly would indeed be made commercially available. In April of 2020, the World Athletics Organization concluded its investigation into carbon-plated footwear and released their findings, along with their recommendations and associated rules around the technology. These rules were, uh, were updated in August of that year, but they boil down to the following key points. Shoes must be commercially available for a minimum of one month prior to use in international competition, thus allowing all athletes the ability to race in them if they choose. For road races, the shoe height must not exceed 40 millimetres. And for track events, the shoe height must not exceed 25 millimetres for events 800 metres and above, and below these distances, 20 millimetres. What does this mean for the next percent and the alpha flies? Well, for the time being, alpha flies are relegated to road races only, whilst the next percent can still be worn for track races. Personally, as a non-distance runner, I think this is a solid middle ground. Both shoes remain available to wear in competition with limitations and shoe companies have firm rules in which to work with moving forward. So what are they like to train in? Having run now in both the Next Percents and the Alpha Flies, I do have to say that I do prefer the Next Percents for things like hills and longer runs off the track. But on the track, I do also like the Next Percents for things like 800s, 600s, and just sessions that there's a lot of something in them. So if we're doing like a lot of 300s and I just want to take the pressure off my calves and not wear heeled spikes, then I'll stick these on. The bulkier nature of the Alpha Flies does make me see them more as a shoe I would wear in my preparation for running fast and not necessarily for a fast race or a fast rep or whatever. Being a sprinter, I've always had spikes that are lightweight, streamlined and by default just a smaller shoe in general. The Alpha Flies really do take a bit of mental adjustment on this front. Having said that, they are a really light shoe and I have been wearing them to warm up before races and race modelling sessions and they're great. The AirPods give you a great little lift that really help you feel on top of your game and really fast. Because of this, the Alpha Flies will be the shoe that I continue to wear up and warm up in before races this season. In preparation for racing, I'll also be using the Next Percent as the shoe I do my pre-race comp strides in. The combination of support, lightweightedness and overall speed makes them the perfect shoe to wear as I physically prep for a race the next day as I'll feel fast and that really helps put you in the right mindset. So I guess you can probably tell that I actually really like the carbon plated shoe. I have thoroughly enjoyed all the time that I've had running in them, whether it be pre-comp or pre-session or actually doing a session. Um, I have primarily worn the Nike ones. Well, I've only worn the Nike ones and that's for two reasons. One, um, I just know what Nike shoes suit my foot, so I can pretty much just order them online and have them come to me um, on release date. But also, um, all the other carbon ones are really hard to come by in the Australian market at the moment. I do know the Adidas ones did have a release date, and basically everyone I spoke to or knew of who was really into the, this technology, uh, they didn't even know it was coming out. So you know, they were released and then they were sold out next minute. So as they do become more widely available, the carbon shoes, I will be really, really keen to try the, to try other styles of them. Um, I do just want to say though, like I know a lot of people are saying that it is, you know, mechanical doping and it gives people unfair advantage and that these shoes should be banned altogether. But I think you have to take into account the fact that yes, the research does show that 
you know, you do get a little bit of an extra advantage. I believe that all the articles I looked at did say about 4% towards the end of a marathon race, which thus was the name of the 4% of Nikes. But you still have to do the work. Putting on a carbon shoe is not going to make you run a marathon if you've never trained for it. And if you don't train at the pace and the speed that you want to achieve, again, putting on a carbon shoe is not going to get you there. You know, it's just that it's just a little 1% that you can take on. But having said that, there's been so many race results where I think a guy ran a pair of Crocs the other day, you know, so these are not the be all and end all of shoes. They're just another option out there in a very diverse market. Um, so thank you very much for watching a, another video. I hope that you enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed learning the history of the shoe. I'd heard so much about them and it was really interesting to sit down and actually chronicle the history of the development of the shoe that's become so popular. Um, if you have tried any other of the carbon shoes do comment down below i am curious what you'd recommend i know that adidas ones have a slightly different base in that they have no grip on them so is that true or is that just concept designs and that's the way they look on the, the web and i know since then there's just been a few more released and there's more coming to market so i'd be keen to know what people think about those um, don't forget to like and subscribe for future videos and I will say there will be some future videos because the technology that's come out of these shoes, bits and pieces of them have gone into other shoes across the market and I'm keen to try them and see what they're like. So see you in my next video.